to the Living Farms podcast, the place where we discuss biodynamic practices worldwide for you, your farm and the planet. So welcome to the Living Farms podcast. Today we have Johannes Wirtz with us and he was the co-leader of the section for natural sciences at the Goetheanum and we will talk about bees today. So welcome, Johannes. Welcome. Thank you. So to come for the start, um, how did you come across biodynamic agriculture and why did you decide to do biodynamic beekeeping? Um, it has something to do with chance or karma. After I finished my PhD thesis at the University of Basel, I got an invitation by Jochen Bockemühl, the former leader of the science section at the Gutianum. And one of my first projects has been on the green land around the Gutianum. So this is maybe the first time I learned something about biodynamic agriculture. And at the sa same time, two years later, I started a bee project at the Gutianum. And the story behind is funny. When I arrived, I realized that in spite of 30 years of biodynamic agriculture around the Gutianum, there were no butterflies and no grasshoppers. So uh, something I believe that should be impossible. And then together with a colleague, we started to study the reasons for this um, depletion of butterflies and grasshoppers. And the answer was very easy. The meadows around the Gutiano were all mowed in one time. And the master gardener at the Gutiano in these days, since there were no cows, had the intention to make a grass compost somehow to mimic what usually the cow does. And in order to do so, They had, had to cut the grass early in the morning when all insects are still on the ground. And so removing grass and composting, this um, wet grass, or I should say the grass with the mo morning dew, um, resulted in the fact that all the insects were composted as well. And so with um, something that is called staggered mowing, um, with the intent to ha have all different developmental stage of a meadow, cut, growing stage, flowering stage, rooting and seed formation stage, we arrived um, to make the situation for butterflies much better. And only three years after the beginning of this project, there have been 25 species of butterflies, some of them on the red list that had not been there for more than 30 years. It was magic. And even the colleagues at the University of Basel were quite surprised about this uh, rapid improvement. At the same time, in the 90s, we had many discussions with the pioneers of biodynamic beekeeping at the Glasshouse Science Section. Varroa had come to Europe, we must say, um, imported by a bee research institute from Germany, when they took over from Asia, Apis Terana colonies to make studies. So it was a kind of um, unintended situation. And Varroa then spread rapidly all over Europe and later to US, etc. And these pioneers wanted to discuss the spiritual background and issues about Varroa. And I don't want to tell the discussions, they were sometimes quite funny. But after this uh, amazing success with butterflies, I believe that this place around the Gutiarn could be a place for honeybees. And I started together with two beekeepers a project called keeping bees without chemical treatment against Varroa. I didn't know anything about bees. And so 
the design was such that they were two colonies on the Gutianum ground, two colonies somewhere in the village of Lornach and two colonies up at the Gempen. And um, I had the task to observe and monitor and document the two colonies on the Gutianum ground. It was a terrible situation for me because I didn't know anything about bees and I had to open the colonies every 21 day to monitor the population dynamics. And you can imagine 21 days, irrespective of whether there would be a thunderstorm or not, sometimes my hair, my hair was standing up in the air and I must admit I was afraid of the bees. In the end of the project, and you must imagine 1996 or something like that, he had documented, in most cases, colony collapse. Even in these, these early times, there was no way that bees would survive. But in these four years of uh, working with bees, I fell in love. This was the reason to become a beekeeper. Wow. And, and I mean, this is, I think, a common thing for people that they are afraid of bees. But how did you change your mind or... What fascinated you about the bees? Well, when I looked at uh, my deep friends, Martin Detli and Xaver Wirt, they were able to work with bees without protection. This is one thing. The other thing is, despite of my fear, I felt so close to them. And there is this, I cannot say it's kind of an... Um, mixture of harmony, beauty, wisdom. And even today, when I visit my bees, I go into a world I cannot exactly describe. It's a world without time. It's a world without space. It's just being connected. And interestingly enough, I lost my fear after some six or seven years of being a beekeeper. And I never forget this moment. It was early spring. The first time I wanted to open my eyes. And then I had kind of an imagination. I saw the whole bee season in front of my inner eye. And from then on, something happened. And uh, usually when people ask, where is your beekeeper suit? I say, this is it. Huh? I can go there, I would say 98% of all the time without protection, and without anything. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I mean, you started with, with biodynamic beekeeping at the beginning then. And um, I mean, you're now doing several projects with people and, and you're quite involved in the, in the beekeeping community, I would say. Um, how was it for you to, to see how other beekeepers are, are working? Like, What is the difference between the, the different uh, working attitudes or perspectives? Yes, there are major differences. But the first thing I must say, I respect all the beekeepers in the way they care for the bees, be it conventional, be it organic or be it biodynamic. And to, I can say a few words about the all differences between biodynamic and conventional beekeeping. And what I say actually goes back to the bee lectures of Steiner. Rudolf Steiner gave them in the year 1923. So just after the first Gautianum had been burned down by a maniac. And there he started these lectures because among these mostly non-anthroposophical uh, workers, there was a beekeeper. And he wanted to know what Steiner would think about artificial green breeding. And the pioneers of biodynamic beekeeping started to somehow extract out of these lectures the basic principles of this biodynamic beekeeping and only 1995, if I re remember correctly, there were the standards there for biodynamic beekeeping. And the standards say we are allowed to multiply the colonies 
only when it shows that it wants to swarm. First point. So one would say it's kind of a restriction because you can only do it from early May to mid of June. Nobody or not many people in conventional beekeeping do it like that because they want to replace their queens latest at the age of two years. This is one aspect. The second aspect is that they don't like root cycle interruption. And of course, when a car is warming for all the new units that are developing, there is a shorter or longer time where the colony has no brood. As a result, the load of brood diseases, and varroa, for instance, is a brood disease, but also fowl brood or American or European fowl broods, the load goes way down. So what seems to be a disadvantage, because you have this brood stop and they are not, these are not collecting honey in these days, is on the other hand an advantage because, and I believe it is the most important hygienic behavior, they reduce pathogen and disease load. Okay. The second thing they could extract or found in the bee lectures is that Steiner was talking about the combs as a skeleton of the colony. And it was it's quite clear if the colony is the organism, it should be able to develop its bones on itself. And from there, uh, the standards today say it is mandatory that um, on the combs where the brood nest is developing, it must be built by natural combs. Again, the disadvantage of this um, procedure is um, that you first lose six to 10 kilograms of honey that are needed to construct one square meter of combs, let's say. And the second thing, they some, somehow conventional beekeepers criticize is that we have more drone cells in our colonies than in the conventional ones. Okay. But the advantage is such. First, the load with pesticide residues in natural combs is always lower than in beekeeping systems where you are working with foundations and even more if you work with a so-called closed wax cycle. This means the beekeepers take out old combs, they are melted, and afterwards they make the foundations out of it. And you can see that um, all pesticides, fungicides, fungicides, and herbicides that are fat-soluble will be found in um, the combs, in the wax. And interestingly enough, and I could not believe it, uh, an expert at the University of Hohenheim has told me that even today, in systems with a closed wax cycle, you can detect DDT. And DDT has been prohibited in the early of the 70s, last century. So we can learn one lesson, pesticides and all these so-called plant protection substances have a very, very long shelf life, we could say. And second, it can accumulate if you are always using the same wax. So we, and this is, uh, has been shown quite often that the, the, the amount of these um, pesticides in our wax is much lower than many conventional wax. The second thing is that um, drones per se are not um, are part of the whole organism. And um, I believe that good colonies, strong colonies make good drones that could eventually um, be um, propagated into or by, by, by queen mating propagated into other colonies. And interestingly enough, um, the 
more drones you have in a colony, the less likely it is that the colony wants to swarm. The details for that are not that important, but this is also for beekeepers that don't like to uh, have too many swarm could be an advantage. And then the third aspect also extracted from the bee lectures has been that um, the queen of a colony is not the boss of the colony, but the heart. The queen is the one that holds together all these sometimes 30, 35,000 bees. And um, replacing the queen by artificial means is like a arch transplantation surgery. So this was the reason no artificial queen breeding. And again, some beekeepers say disadvantage because if you do not breed in the artificial way, you cannot control with what drones they made at these uh, drone congregation places in the region. And they say you lose good properties, you lose good characters. On the other hand, and this is the advantage of this, and, and the third disadvantage I must say is that, of course, if you make this natural mating, allow this for natural mating, then you may eventually lose um, the race or subspecies specific properties. Because in these drone congregation places, we will find the drones from all the beekeepers. And when I look into my colonies, I see whether there has been a guy who is working with the black bee, the original subspecies in Europe, whether he has been working with the Italian bee, or whether he has been working with um, the buckfast bee. So you lose these different subspecies by natural mating. On the other hand, if you look now at the advantages, it is clear that the more drones, different drones, can mate with a queen, the more, the healthier, the more resilient, etc., is the colony. This has been shown, proven um, many, many times. No question. The second aspect is that mating locally means you get an adaptation of the colony to a specific place. And again, there are many, many studies that have shown that locally adapted colonies are better than colonies that have queens that are not locally adapted in terms of vitality, resilience, dancing and dynamics, flight range, and even um, foraging activities. So you see it is kind of a question, where do you put your weight and where are you ready to take some disadvantage, disadvantage into account? Mm -hmm. And to lose the race for me is, or the subspecies status for me is less dramatic compared to local adaptation. Mm -hmm. and, and the last thing that, then I, will, then I will stop with these standards, but the last thing they extracted um, from the bee lectures, if you want to see the colony as a whole, you should make sure that the brood nest is not interrupted by wood or whatsoever, so you should take care about the unity of the brood nest. And as a consequence, there are certain Hiving systems in Europe and the US that are for sure not suited for biodynamic beekeeping. But beside that, you can do biodynamic beekeeping in every possible hiving system. So what I want to say is um, there are two different philosophies. And I would say the one is closer to the needs uh, of the colony. The other one is further away. And the loss of honey 
blood interruption, etc., is a consequence I really can carry along or come along with. Yeah, there. thank you so much, Johannes. There are some things which are really resonating with me. Um, because, for example, also this, this picture of the, the bee queen um, being the heart of the of the overall hive is something which, um, like, I, I don't have that experience as you have with beekeeping, but I, I had the chance to have some experience. And... Um, And when I when I first started, um, we got some some bees which had some queens which had uh, cutted wings. And for me, this was really like it. It was really something which was irritating me, but it came out of this idea to um, prevent that the the, the queen is um, is swarming. And for me, it looked so sad when I saw this. And I think for, for me, the biodynamic beekeeping is, as you said, more close to the needs of the, of the hive and of the animal instead of focusing on the needs of the farmer or the, the beekeeper, <laughs> so to say. And um, that's sometimes challenging because not everybody has the, the time or to, um, yeah, to, to, to prioritize the bees instead of their own time. So how do you manage like that the swarms can naturally swarm and um, how do you manage this with your time schedules? Well, I must admit that um, in the standards, the best thing you can do is let your colony swarm. But you are allowed, when you see that a colony wants to swarm, to take out the swarm, which means the old queen, with maybe some 15,000 bees, before they have been swarming out. So you can make a kind of an artificial swarm with the old queen. And then you are also al allowed to um, divide these uh, remaining bees into different units to make new colonies. And when we make them um, in our bee courses, we tell the participants that if they somehow take the swarm out three days before the first queen cell is um, tapped, then you do it in the moment where the old colony is in dissolution. Because in these last three days, we know from um, studies, first, the queen is fed with more sugar, less protein. So the queen will reduce the ovaries, become less um, lighter, less heavy. And um, in contrast, the worker bees, they get heavier because they are filling their um, honey stomach with honey. And 80% of all the bees in a colony ready to swarm start to activate the wax gland. So you see that the, the colony itself knows something will happen. And this is the moment where we are allowed to take the swarm with the old queen and make new colonies. By the way, in the bee lecture, Stein spoke, as I said, Combs are the skeleton, the queen is the heart, and the swarming process is a moment of near death of the old colony. And for me, it was for a long time a bit irritating because the few times I've seen flying a swarm out, it was joy and happiness. Yeah? But sometimes then a beekeeper can start to reflect what this this mean that a so-called death process could be joy and happiness. And then we go, would go deeper into something. And when I don't want to elaborate too much on that, but for me, it is very clear. Um, death belongs to life. There's without, there's no life. The second thing is I'm convinced that humans or others in a moment of birth, are dying in a kind of a world and having birth in a new one. And in the end of the life, 
The death here means a birth in another place. So this is not a, a how should I say, an absolute beginning and a total end. These are moments of transition. And maybe we somehow can grasp a little bit of uh, this moment of transition with respect to the beast that is not only sorrow, but is also joy. It's interesting because they are when they're swarming, they're also so quiet in a way. I mean, they're not at all aggressive or or but they're like really inwardly oriented and and have this very interesting calmness. And um, I think that's also something which you can transport sometimes if you if you work as a beekeeper. Um, it's it's something you talked at the beginning about getting um, stinked by the bees, but you reduce this rate if, if you are calm by yourself or like if you, if, if you try to meditate beforehand or like settle yourself, so to say. So how do you prepare yourself before getting interacted with the bees? Well, there is this, uh, I would say, this um, constitutive part after more than 20 years of beekeeping. I don't have to do a lot of exercises to calm down because I know that if I'm in a hurry, if I'm stressed, the first thing I currently feel the bees are feeling is the stress of the beekeeper. That's quite sure. But um, I start, when I start to work with the bee, with a very... Um, short ritual to not only think what I'm doing as a beekeeper, but somehow to remind what bees maybe are in a larger context. And I say a few words that blew to me like bees are flying to me. And these words I can tell them because I think it is nice. It starts um, You are related to the sun and you are a kin. Eh, sorry, I start again. You are born out of the sun. You are a kin or related to man. I admire your beauty. I admire your wisdom. And I am grateful that I can work with you, live with you, learn from you. And then I start to smoke and things go on. Wow. And then for me, this I sometimes believe that we should many at many instances in our everyday life have this moment of I call it ritualization of work. Because although it's for sure not quantifiable, the quality of the result of your work changes if you do it with love or respect or if you do it in um st under stress or even with a bad mood and feeling and it's so interesting that the b courses that are existing are they are always fully booked because the people <laughs> i think they're really looking for um for getting to to come into these rituals and come into a relationship with nature Or how would you say, what are the reasons for this big interest in beekeeping? Um, yeah, I think you are right. And two weeks or three weeks ago, we had our own bee course at the Gutian with some 23 people. And then um, it was a rainy day, so we had ample time to discuss. And we asked the question, why do you want to work Or to live with bees. And um, honey or wax or pollen or whatsoever was not the main topic. People said, I feel peace. I feel harmony. I enter into a world of timelessness. I learn to be very careful and mindful when I'm working with the bees. So all of a sudden you had the impression everybody wanted to be with bees for reasons of inner health or inner harmony or inner qualities. And I think that's um, really something that is distracting 
um, is attracting people. And in our course, of course, we say it's very nice to get some honey sometimes. We know that we get a lot of wax because we are replacing old bones every time. But the main thing is this deep connectedness with the bees. And if we look from a more, uh, how should I say, ecological perspective, honey is one part, but the most important part of bees and all pollinators is pollination. And then, of course, the next step when we are working with bees is the question, how must the surrounding look like in order to fulfill the needs the bees, not only for a short time or period in the springtime or in the summertime is um, honeydew from, from the forest, etc., etc. And we learn that this being connected, we see so deeply and that affects us so deeply when we look at the comb, is also realized outside there in this connection and interactions of um, bees and flowers. So what could people do to support and learn about bees and and how to how could they come into this connection with the bees? Well, the one thing is that um, we can open, discuss it and share these moments when we felt connected or moments where we are disconnected. To ask, how do you feel? We are making exercises to go a little bit deeper into this realm where we do not only observe and judge, but also learn to feel. And then, of course, as soon as you start to work with bees, be it that we uh, look at, take out the comb, sometimes the participants take out, you are really in this world. And it's amazing that you can look at the comb for 20 or 30 minutes and from the outside, somebody would say total stress, being there, no excited or agitated peace, this peace, this harmony, perfect. And that's what they take home. And we had once a very nice word in the last course of a seminar where a young woman said, I want to learn something about bees, but I have learned something for my life. Yeah, and then I think it cannot be better than that. And I totally believe that if you are together as a human being, so to say, that if you if you have happened to um, be at peace with yourself, this reflects on the environment around you and not just on the people, but also on the natural environment. So, yeah, yeah. it is for sure the case. Yeah. And of course, when you have the opportunity to work with um, in a seminar from March to October, then you are not obliged. You see how is the year going on. And all of a sudden, they realize that the flower situation is so poor that in um, some years we have to start feeding May or June. And then all of a sudden you realize that what you see here is kind of a mirror of what is out there in your surrounding and the surrounding of a colony is amazingly large. Three kilometers um, radius or six kilometers diameter comes to some 30 square kilometers for one colony. I must tell you, I don't know how it looks like <laughs> three kilometers away from my bees. <laughs> But if there's nothing coming in, you really think, see, something goes wrong. So we should start um, spreading those seed bombs. I don't know if you if you know them. Those like balls where you have a lot of like flowers, uh, flower seeds in it, and whenever you take a walk, you just drop them on the different places. <laughs> it, is, it is a very nice thing to do, but this is of course not the solution. Yeah. 
<laughs> if everybody would do it or everybody would start in her garden or his or her garden or even on a balcony to plant um, bee-friendly plants, it could help. But um, to work in a really sustainable and how should I say future way, we need a change in agriculture. This is for sure. But as long as we can substitute honey by sugar, if you don't want to look at, you don't see it. And of course, um, I have some colleagues that, that are, um, how do you call it, uh, putting bees where the flowers are. So you start close to oil seed rape, then you go to chestnut, then you go to linden tree, and um, you can earn amazingly amazing amount of honey. And then very clearly when the season is over, maybe in July, you start to feed sugar. But what we would need is a continuous nectar flow from early spring to late or late summer or early autumn. And I, I think, again, it's, the bees are not just there for the honey, but they have such an important role in the overall organism of the landscape or the, the earth even. And I you're probably better with the numbers, but I read like, if the bees would be completely eradicated, we would just have like one quarter of the food that we have in the supermarkets now, because they also pollinate, I mean, a lot of our food. And it's um, if they if they get away and if they die as they are currently dying, then um, our food supply will be drastically diminished in the future. This is for sure the diversity of... Um... Root, berries, vegetables would be amazingly small without pollination. But for me, the honeybee is maybe the bee that um, has the best life in these days. And we should know that beside the honeybee we love, there are some 450 to 500 species of solitary bees. There are, of course, bumblebees, wasps, etc., And in an environment that is not in a good shape, they cannot survive. So I always say the bees are so to speak the lens through which you can somehow judge the situation for all pollinators. And if it's fine for the bees, it is very likely fine for all the different pollinators. And I think it is a, a so should I say, a um, wrong thing to play with solitary bees and honeybees as competitors. Of course, if there are too many, too many hives around, this may be a situation. But most of the time, in the beginning of this kind, the so-called competition is lack of flower. And flowers are lacking because um, the way... We are doing agriculture because all the surfaces we need for building and construction, etc. So that's a that's a perfect um, beginning for the ending, so to say. <laughs> because at the end of the podcast, I ask each guest what his or her three main reasons are to continue work in biodynamic agriculture and in your case in biodynamic beekeeping so what keeps you alive about biodynamic beekeeping to continue this work despite the sometimes incredibly devastating situation that we have in the environment mm. it's we we are, are asked these questions very often because there are people who say Responsibility would mean to withdraw from beekeeping. I say, as long as more than 95% of all the beekeepers do it the conventional way, it is very nice to have a small group that shows that other ways are possible. And as you have said before, the, the way you are working with the bees has impacts 
on our um, way, looking outside, observing nature, and also has impact on our, I should say, how should I say, um, capability to see dignity, to see harmony, etc., through nature. And I'm pretty sure that these are soft qualities we need to change or transform the world or the beekeeping. And um, I strongly believe, like with um, all the banks that are crashing this moment, there will be a point or a time with this whole conventional food system or even a beekeeping system will crash. And I'm deeply convinced that biodynamic agriculture and biodynamic beekeeping is not the solution for everything, but shows towards the solution for everything. And I would just like to, to recall uh, the first thing with respect to pollinators in agriculture. I think it has been the seventh lecture in the course for farmers, where Steiner is talking about these nature-intimate cross-interactions. And for me, this is the ecological lecture. And it's amazing to see that he says, if you look to the farm as a whole, you should have all the organs that belong to the farm. And from, from wetlands to um, um, Magerrasen, what is it in English? Yes, uh, meadows with with uh, low, um, yeah, diversity. So, oh no, it's not low diversity, but like, yeah, nutrients. And the more diverse things are, and the more in balance they are, the better for the whole. And irrespective of what is said about them, um, biodynamic agriculture and preparations, we know that a good practice is increasing the resource the farmings the farms are using, the soil. And when Paul Mattersam um, now 20 years ago in this um, prestigious journal Science has reported the first uh, first report on this uh, DOK a project, a comparison of um, dynamic, organic and conventional agriculture, um, a reviewer has said this is kind of the eighth wonder of the world, that you are using a resource and you are not depleting it, but you are making more. And for sure, this is the way to go. If we are talking now on a global scale, because if we are just using up all this um, resource soil, well, I don't know how long we can do it with um, agricultural things like that. And the second thing that is also connected and very important, so we could say um, the first thing is um, improving soils means doing something for the climate. And the second thing, asking what does an organism, farm organism needs in order to be healthy and resilient this is the question of diversity. So I think both aspects are fulfilled by good biodynamic, biodynamic um, farming or production systems. And in such an organism, the bees, be it the honeybees or all the solitary bees, will not only have an, um, a security to survive, but will help to develop and evolve the whole um, world of the plants and flowers. Mm -hmm. And this is for me, so to speak, the bar vision of um, after the crash or omitting or going around the crash. And of course, I know many people now start to argue about can we feed the world by organic or biodynamic agriculture? But for me, the core question is how do we want to feed the world? 
And if we change the house from what is done today, crazy for everybody. Well, thank you so much, Johannes. Um, I will link a lot of um, references that you gave me beforehand in the show notes and um, link so for those people that are interested in reading further, learning more about beekeeping and biodynamics, um, they can read it up there. And um, as you said, you're also doing the beekeeping courses. So that's, that's also something which can be done for those people interested to dive more into the topic and yeah thank you so much for this interview and just keep up the great work you're doing <laughs> thank you for the invitation <laughs> thank you and see all of you soon <laughs>